I'm Elisa Parker. We're broadcasting from the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. 17 years of this incredible festival here in Nevada City in Grass Valley, California, at the base of the Sierras. Several thousand folks who I call them the everyday environmental action heroes come to connect, to screen their films, and really to be part of the solution to some of our most dire issues that we're facing right now. One of the, actually two of the extraordinary people we're featuring right now is Mary Power and Jim Estes of the film, The Serengeti. It's great to have you both here with us. Thank you. Welcome, have you been to Wild and Scenic before? Have not. Never. Never, not no. been to Nevada City? No. I've been through Nevada City en route east and west, that's it. Well, so. now you, now it's gonna suck you in. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. what yes, happens here charming, in this, right? Yeah. So uh, the film, The Serengeti, I mentioned earlier that it's one of those films that when folks ask, which film should I see or which ones really struck you? I mean, they are all unique in their own way, but The Serengeti had some really key powerful takeaways for me, both, um, and Jim, I want you to expand on this about the concept of upgrading and downgrading, and also how important predators are to our ecosystem. I mean, they are a vital part of our ecosystem and this film, The Serengeti, highlights that. I should also mention that Mary and Jim are both scientists and were brought together um, by another scientist. So can you expand on that a little bit and tell them how, how this all formed, how you all got connected, and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the key aspects of the film. Sean Carroll is the education director for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and Howard Hughes is getting concerned about the level of general biological scientific literacy in the US. So he first got acquainted with an amazing trophic cascade. What we're calling the role of predators is that a top predator can suppress, for example, an herbivore and release vegetation in a certain way. Or sometimes there's a predator of a predator, so it looks different. But Sean first became aware of the role that a virus as a top predator played in Serengeti. The virus killed domestic cattle and all of the antelope, and then that changed the Serengeti grasslands. So after that, he started reading related work, Jim's kelp work, my river work, and work in tropical rainforests, and he's seeing that this control chain applies in all ecosystems. As a developmental geneticist, he knew it also applied within our bodies and controls our health because you have a gene and it could be expressed, but if there's a repressor, it's not. But if there's a derepressor, it is. So it's this another little cascade. So his book covers both medical and ecological examples. The movie is just ecological. So, and Jim, uh, we'll talk about to your experience both in, on, in the river with the bass fish. And Jim, uh, you were doing work, what year was this? Was this back in the 60s or 70s? This, this was uh, beginning 1970. Okay. I became involved with working on kelp forests and sea otters and I went to Alaska in uh, October of 1970 and, and my work began then and has continued. Yeah. What is it that you discovered around uh, the kelp forests initially in studying the sea otters? There well, was a turning point there. What I discovered, uh, uh, largely through the motivation of Bob Payne, who's also featured in this movie as, as the intellectual centerpiece of the work that we've been doing, but uh, Bob encouraged me to think about not how the kelp forests were influencing otters so much, but how the otters might be influencing the kelp forests. And uh, I did that simply by going to islands where otters had once been, but had become extinct because of fur hunting. And I had this uh, uh, comparison of islands with and without otters, and so I was able to see the effects of otters simply by going to islands with otters and islands without otters that were otherwise the same. Yeah. And what I discovered was that they were having a massive impact by feeding on sea urchins and thus imp impacting the kelp beds. When otters were gone, the urchins became abundant and the kelp forest disappeared, and that was essentially my story. And Mary, can you tell us about your story and the bass? So in the um, early 80s, my advisor, who was Bob Payne, made me read Jim's work, and I just, you know, everybody that reads his work is awed and inspired. But I went to a river in Oklahoma with a, an Oklahoma colleague, soon to be a very dear friend, and we looked down from the bank, and some pools were emerald green, and then other similar pools were barren. And I knew in about two or three pools what was going on. This was a Jim Estes situation we could do experiments because it what didn't involve a heroic deep Alaskan diving. We could just go down that stream bank and um, move, rearrange minnows, which were the herbivores, and then the green algae were an alga called Clodophora, that was our kelp, 
and then we could also rearrange the bass. So we could even take a green pool, split it down the middle, add bass minnows to one side, add bass to another, keep it, you know, rearrange the number of trophic levels. And within five weeks, the, we could change pools from green to barren or barren to green, throw a bass in a barren pool. They eat the minnows or some minnows flee through the shallows that are too shallow for the bass to pass. And you turn that pool green and the dynamics are just as fast with minnows when they're released from bass turning a green pool barren. So you have these predators, the bass, right. who are really um, driving that ecosystem exactly. and the There's river, Jim, which is just like Jim's what model. happened with the exactly. sea otters. And then um, yes. Bob Payne, who you mentioned, it, the film kicks off where it's tidal pools mm -hmm. and realizing, well, what would happen if there aren't starfish in those tidal pools? And so he does this experiment and all of a sudden it becomes what it was just, was it sea anemones or urchins? Without, just destroyed. Without starfish, right. it was a monoculture of mussels. Mussels, just mussels that's right. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. fascinating of just, and, and we, when you think of like what makes, might make sense for our listeners or viewers right now is we've seen this recently mm. with the wolves in Yellowstone yes. introducing predators and seeing pretty much like and a pretty quick turnaround how there are more beavers how it's changing the plant life um, I think that's fascinating uh, Jim you it sounds like you coined the phrase around upgrading and downgrading can you tell us a little bit about that well um, it, it really begins with the uh, kind of a, a departure from what was the underlying notion of the way nature works, and that was from sunlight to plants to herbivores to carnivores, and that the abundance of carnivores was largely driven by the abundance of plants and, and so on. And, and when we discovered the trophic cascades, we also recognized that the loss of of carnivores resulted in a system in which higher trophic levels were also lost and so that became the term for that became trophic downgrading that is the loss of the high trophic level species thus having a, a, an impact on the entire uh, re remainder of the ecosystem and upgrading was simply the converse and that is taking a system that's downgraded and repatriating the things that are supposed to be there to get it working like it's supposed to work and and there's some examples in the film there's an area where there's been areas, you know, really uh, controlled areas, like in Scotland, for example, where you can see the significant difference. And I don't remember what it is that they reintroduced in Scotland. So in Scotland, the story was that uh, wolves were lost from those islands uh, and the red deer became extremely abundant and they essentially destroyed the forests. And what was done was simply putting out uh, exclosures to keep the red deer out and to essentially reconstruct what that system would have looked like had wolves been there. And sure enough, the forest reappeared. And there's other examples where there's islands where it was known there were some of the predators there and others where there weren't. And it was dramatic. You could see the difference in the plant life there virtually dying off because they weren't there. Um, I, I was telling Mary and Jim, I think this is revolutionary in a sense, first of all, just these discoveries, the importance of predators that they have in our ecosystems and our everyday lives. And also, can you just speak to when we look at uh, where we are now? Because um, that was the other part when, you know, there was a point in the film where you're like, oh my gosh, this is dire. And then you look and see there's actually solutions and we're seeing, we can see some pretty rapid turnaround. Can you share some of those examples and the upgrading, Jim and Mary, that we've seen recently in addition to the wolves in Yellowstone? Well, the wolves in Yellowstone is one example. Another really wonderful example is the Gorongosa uh, Park in, in Mozambique. And there, all the wildlife was devastated by civil war and now is being repatriated and they are seeing the same kinds of things in Africa, the same sorts of ecosystem recovery with the repatriation of the large herbivores and the carnivores and so on and so forth. So that's, that's another example. Um, you know, the, the recovery of sea otters along the west coast of North America is another example of trophic upgrading. Um, and those are the ones that come immediately right. to mind. California is a very happy example because Californians have been really remarkable, as people, remarkably tolerant of predators re recolonizing our right. state. So we have lots of mountain lion sightings now. And we, I manage an old growth reserve that's 
um, in central Mendocino near the coast. We got mountain lions back in about 1993. We stopped hearing the coyotes, which I was sad about, but it was an instant three-level food chain in the meadows. The deer went away and you know, certain vegetation came back. Came back. So the, a colleague, a friend of ours at uh, Berkeley, Dustin Brashears, has been studying the reintroduction, the wolves, even wolverines in the eastern Sierra and mountain lions starting to have more of an influence in California. And Californians so far have been remarkably tolerant and, and accepting, and welcoming even. That's amazing. It's I mean, great. I just think when even revolutionary, I think you both are revolutionary too in your discoveries. It's it has a dramatic impact on our current ecosystems right now, both your discoveries and the work you're doing. It's very significant. Um, Jim, what are you working on right now, or what's what's captured your attention? Are you still focused on sea otters? Well, no, I'm retired. I just retired from the University of California last spring, okay. and uh, I'm doing a lot of things. I'm, uh, but I'm writing a couple of books. Uh, I'm writing a book on megafauna. On and megafauna? Megafauna, which okay. are big animals, uh, all flavors of big animals from different species, uh, herbivores, carnivores, and so on. And, and, and the, 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 the drift of that book is going to be on the evolution of, of large body size, on the costs and benefits of large body size, and then the ecological consequences of large body size in awesome. nature. Awesome. Um, so that's... that's uh, 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 in addition to pursuing my, my recreational passions of fishing and so on, that's what I'm doing these days. Does this, did this discovery, does it give you ho some hope? I, you, I think with... that uh, and from my perspective, it, it changed my whole view of nature. Yeah. And the way it puts it put together. Mm -hmm. what, what has been remarkable to me is the recurrence of these patterns from ecosystem to ecosystem to ecosystem, from species to species. These, these are are processes that are widely reoccurring in nature. And so what I think it tells us is that this is one way toward conservation that had really not been thought of. It isn't protecting just the place, but it is protecting the place and restoring the players in that place. Right. And those players have to be there to make the place work right. How about for you, Mary? What I'm doing now, a couple of things, but what I'd like to tell you about is the effect of flood or drought on rivers because for the last 30 years I've worked on the Eel River food web and you know we went through this terrible almost five year drought recently. So what resets the system and makes it possible for there to be actually a four level trophic cascade that supports growth of young salmon, that's the scouring winter floods that come and, and get rid of some of the insects that salmon can't eat that are slow to recover. But if you don't get those floods, if you have warm, stagnant water in the summer, you've probably noticed algae accumulate and they rot in place. If the algae are, if the rivers can continue to flow, algae that aren't eaten locally or flushed out to the estuaries or the coastal oceans, very excellent quality food initially. But if it gets warm and stagnant, our good edible algae are overgrown by toxic algae, cyanobacteria. So what you get in the eel is if you have healthy flooding, you can have a, a three or a four level food chain that's based on very edible algae and support salmon. If you don't allocate enough flow, if you have the drought or if you're taking too much summer water out of the river, then those algae rot and they fuel the growth of hot loving toxic algae yeah not and good. people's dogs are starting to die wow yeah. wow so that's what you're focusing on right so now so that's one of the things okay. that, yep it's all interconnected we are all interconnected and in all of this mary power jim estes i'm like just and so grateful for your work and um, and discoveries bob payne in addition to that um, the film is called the serengeti uh, I encourage you to go see it, and I appreciate you both being part of Wild and Scenic and taking the time to be part of this extraordinary festival uh, that's celebrating its 17th year. It's quite wonderful. Thank you. Thank Happy you so much. Happy to be here. Much. Thanks so much. Yes. I'm Elisa Parker, and we'll be back with other stories like these.